time flies. It's been a month already. So without further ado, let's start. Let's cut to the chase. Time again is against us today. We have lots of um, questions with relatively low correct rate today. We need to go through them all. And again, yeah, if you have any question during the mock, mock exam walkthrough, you can save them until the end of the walkthrough and I'll go through them together, okay? Right, so let's start with the first one. Question number two, which has, oh, oh sorry, I forgot to uh, categorize all the questions. Um, I will send the, uh, the correct version of the PPT after this, after the walkthrough, I'll send it in the WeChat, WeChat group. Uh, yes, so question number two. The correct rate is still correct. It's 48%. And Jim and his eight friends are going to share six pizzas equally between them. What fraction of a whole pizza should each of them have? So for this type of question, we will need to find the whole and how many people are sharing the whole. Okay, so the whole is already given to us. It's six pizzas, sorry, six pizzas. And how many people are we, are we talking about here? We have Jim, yeah, that's one and his eight friends. So we have one plus eight, which is nine children. So nine children sharing six pizzas equally, then we can do division. The, the numerator, be careful, should be six instead of nine because they're sharing the pizzas, not sharing children. Not pizzas sharing children, okay? That would be creepy. So it's six pizzas over nine children. And that will give us two over three to leave it in its simplest form. So the correct answer should be E. Okay, so each child will get three, uh, two thirds of one pizza. Okay. Right, and then the second one, question number 10. Uh, which quadrilaterals have two diagonals that must be perpendicular to each other? So we have, for quadrilaterals, we have altogether six types. The first type is a square. And you see, it's two diagonals. They are uh, perpendicular to each other, okay? So it counts. And then the second one, we have a rectangle. And for rectangles, we have a pair of acute angles and a pair of obtuse angles. Okay? So they're not perpendicular to each other. We will need right angles between the, uh, the diagonals in order to, for them to be perpendicular to each other. So rectangles doesn't count. And then we have parallelograms. You see, parallelogram is the same story with rectangles. They have a pair of uh, acute angles and a pair of obtuse angles. Okay, so it doesn't count. And then next we have kites. So for kites, the definition of kite, actually it's, it's property, sorry, not definition, but the property, one property of kite is that its two diagonals are perpendicular to each other. They are called perpendicular bisector, actually. The bisector means that, uh, for example, the, the diagonal CA, divides the diagonal BD into two equal parts. That's the meaning of bisector, okay? But we don't need to use the bisector property now. We just need to use the perpendicular property. For kites, the diagonals are uh, perpendicular to each other. So kites count. So far we have one and two, two quadrilaterals that count. And then we have rhombus, okay? So for rhombus, we use this little bar to represent that the four sides are all equal to each other. Okay, so rhombus is a special type of parallelogram. It has two opposite sides that are, uh, that are parallel to each other, and all four sides are equal to each other. Okay, and for rhombus, its property, one of its property is also the two diagonals are perpendicular to each other. So rhombus also counts. So far we have three of them counts. And the last one is trapezium. So for trapezium is the, the type of quadrilateral with only one pair of opposite um, and opposite sides that are parallel to each other, only one pair. And the other pair, um, there are three types of trapezium. The first type is isosceles trapezium. That means when AD equals to BC, okay? then that is an isosceles trapezium. And when AD is not equal, is unequal to BC, then it will be a scalene trapezium. I'll write it here, scalene, meaning AD and BC, they're not equal to each other. And then at last we have right trapeziums, meaning it looks like something like this. Sorry for my poor drawing. But this line here will be vertical. And these two angles here are right angles. This is right trapezium, okay? But either type, 
example. So all three types of trapezium, we're, we, we don't want to look at um, other properties. We are only looking at the diagonal. Okay? So focusing on the diagonal of trapeziums, pair of, a pair of acute angles and a pair of obtuse angles. So it doesn't count. Okay? So altogether, we only have square, rhombus, and kites, whose diagonals are perpendicular to each other. Okay? So, and then we can look at the choices. So we have squares and rectangles. Rectangles doesn't count, so A crossed out. And then B, kites and parallelograms. Parallelograms doesn't count, so B crossed out. And then C, rhombuses and kites. Okay, we got our correct choice. Our correct answer is C. Uh, but um, it, it will be a good habit to look at all the, all the choices in case it's a multiple choice. Okay. And D, squares and trapeziums. Trapeziums, no, so crossed out. And then E, parallelograms and rectangles. So both doesn't count. Both are wrong answers, so E is definitely wrong. So that's question number 10. Moving on to question number 17. So question number 17, a cube has vertices G, H, I, J, K, L, M, and N. And Q and R are the midpoints of edge H, I, and J, I. Okay, so Q is the midpoint of H, I, and R is the midpoint of side J, I. A cut is made through the plane Q, R, a cut is made through the plane Q, R, and L. So that will be, let me draw it, so you can see it clearly. So we connect Q, R, and we connect Q, L. Uh, because it's at the back side of, of, the, of the cube, I'll write it in, I'll draw it in dotted lines. And R, N as well. And then L, N at last. Is that at the bottom, but we cannot see it. I'll also draw it in dotted lines. Oops, sorry. My poor drawing. Yeah, so the cut side will look like something like this, right? So, um, which name best describes the cut face Q, R, and L? So that is asking us what will be the shape of, of the one I just drew, the Q, R, and L. Right, so to solve this question, let's have a look at L and L first. So the side and L. So you see, because it's a cube, that means it's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Its six sides will all be squares. And NL apparently is the diagonal of a square. That means we can also look at the diagonal at the top square, at the top side of the cube, which is, which is HJ. So we can connect HJ. And through observation, you can tell that QR is parallel to HJ. QR parallel to H, J, okay? And, that, and then, you see, also, obviously, Q, R is not equal to H, J. So this, this uh, information already helps us, can, can, it can help us rule out three choices, okay? Which is the first one, rectangle, no. The B, parallelogram, no. And C, rhombus, no. Why? Because QR is not equal to HJ, that means the QR and L only has one pair of equal sides. One pair of equal sides. And then if you remember uh, the definition for rectangle for parallelogram and rhombus, they all require, require that the quadrilateral to have two pairs of equal sides. Yeah? So for a rectangle, we will have one pair of equal side, Size and two pair of two pairs of equal size. And it's the same for parallelogram, one pair, two pairs. And the rhombus, rhombus is a is a special type of parallelogram, so definitely requires it requires four equal size. Okay, so there's no way we can satisfy these three. Okay. Then we will be choosing between quadrilateral and trapezium. And because, because uh, remember the, the definition for trapezium. The trapezium requires exactly one pair of um, sides that are opposite sides that are equal, uh, sorry, not equal, but par parallel to each other. So we have QR and HJ. QR is not equal to HJ, but QR is indeed parallel to HJ. Okay, so that will give us um, the QR and L. If I draw it in a, in a flat plane, it will look like something like this. This will be QR and this is N. L. So it will be a trapezium. Okay. And why is it not? 
a quadrilateral because we, if we can prove, if we can define this, um, sorry, it should be a cube. Yeah. If we can define this shape to be a trapezium, then we don't need, we, we cannot, we mustn't choose the quadrilateral because quadrilateral is a, um, is a general name for all types of um, 2D closed shapes with four sides, four vertices, and four angles. Okay, so D also not a correct answer. Right, and then that's all for question number 17. We can move on to, oh, and some might ask, why is Q, uh, QL and RN? So these two, let me change the color. So why is QL and RN? So the two blue lines, why are they not parallel to each other? Because uh, this is a tricky part in 3D shapes. Let's have a look. So with, with um, parallel, that means we're only translating. it. We're only changing its position. Okay? We're not rotating of any sort. So that means for, for QL to get a parallel line that has, that has a, uh, the point R included in it, and then we can first move QL at the, at the bottom side, at the back side, sorry, uh, move it horizontally to the right. Okay, then we will have another line that includes point I, and because we know Q is the midpoint, then we know after after translating this line will be so the other point the L will be at the midpoint of LM. Okay, so we get a parallel line of QL at the back side, which is I say this is uh this is X so I X. Okay, and then. We move this line, okay. Um, we only translate it, okay. We uh, we pull it towards us, towards the observer, until it moves to the mid in the middle of the cube, and then it, it includes the point R. So let me draw it. Yeah, not so straightforward. So to get the new line, we will have to find the center of the bottom side, the K L M N which is this point right here. And then we connect it with R. So if you want the two lines, the two sides of, uh, of this trapezium to be parallel to each other, you will need two lines that look like this, okay? But we, what we get instead is Rn. So you see, you have indeed rotated it okay, instead of translating. So they're not parallel anymore, right? So let's move on. That's question number 17. So the next one is question number 21. So um, to do this type of question, there is a really a hundred a way that can make sure that we get it correct is we convert all the fractions into decimals. Okay, that will be the easiest way. So six and a third, let me change back to red, sorry. So A is six and a third and compare it with 6.3. So you all know how to convert a third into decimal. It will be a non-recurring, uh, it will be a recurring so 6.3 and infinite with a dot on the three. And then compared with six point, sorry, compared with 6.3, So because for 6.3, we have 6.30, and for 6.3 dot, the recurring one, we will have 6.3333333. And if you look at the hundredths digit, two digits after the decimal point, you will find that for, for 6.3, we have zero. But for 6, point, for six and a third, we will, have six, we will have three. So that means six, six and a third is larger. So this one is larger than 6.3, and six and a third is larger than 6.3. So A is wrong. It's in the wrong direction. Then let's have a look at B. So nine over six and 10 over seven. Okay, so we can also convert the nine over six into a decimal number, which will be 1.5. And 10 over seven, if you, uh, you can use the calculator or you can also do um, division. So to convert a fraction into a decimal number, we simply divide the numerator by the denominator. So 10 divided by seven, it should give us 1.428571. It's a recurring decimal, okay? And again, to, con to compare um, decimal numbers, we only need to look from the largest place value, which is on uh, the first digit after the decimal point, the tenth digit, 
and then one each, uh, so one digit at a time from left to right. Okay, so we have 1.5 and then 1.4 something. So you see, at the tenth digit, we can already determine which one is larger. The 1.5 is definitely larger, so it should be like this. So B is correct. It is in the correct di uh, direction. So nine number six is larger than ten number seven. And then for C, let's look at all the all the choices. We have fifteen over sixty-four and nine over forty. So if you also you can use the calculator, but I don't recommend. I re I recommend you do division because in in real exams you cannot use calculator. So fifteen over sixty-four. Do it on your own after this walkthrough. Is zero point two three four three seven five. And then nine over 40 is 0 0.225. So you see, we look at the hundredths digit, we see that for the first one, we have three, and for the second one, we have two. So that means the first one must be larger than the second one. So it should be larger. It's, it's in the wrong direction. So C is not a correct answer. And for D, for D, we have three and one seventh and 3.7. So for if we convert the one over seven into a decimal number, we will have uh, so 3.142857. And it's also recurring. And you see already at the tenth digit, we can determine which one is larger. So 3.7 is definitely larger than 3.1. So it will be, it will be smaller. Three and one sevenths will be smaller than 3.7. So it's in the wrong direction again. So D is the wrong, D is the wrong choice. And then the last one, 12 over 25 and 50 over 99. This one, we can use the traditional method. We can convert them into decimal numbers, no problem. 12 over 25 will be um, 0 0.48. And then 50 over 99 will be 0 0.50 with the five zero recurring. So again, looking at the tenths digit, we have five and a four. So obviously the five is larger than the four. So 50 over 99 will be larger than 12 over 25. So it's a, 12 over 25 is smaller and it's larger here. So it's in the wrong direction. So E is not a correct choice. But with this one, I would like to give you a little recap about the, uh, the benchmark method we talked about during, during the summer holiday term course. So um, the benchmark method is basically find a common, a common fraction that both numbers are close to and then one one will definitely be smaller than the benchmark, and the other fraction will be definitely be, be larger than the benchmark. And for this one, if you are number sensitive, if you have done lots of lots of decimal calculations, you will find that for twenty five, um, if we want to find a half, so 20, 12 over twenty five is really close to a half because twelve point five over twenty five is a half. Okay. And then for 50 over 99, we don't need to find the, uh, we don't need to find the half of 99. We can just find two times 50. So two times of 50 is 50 over 100. This is also a half. Okay. And then we compare the 12 over 25 with a half and also the 50 over 99 with a half. Okay. So 12 over 25 is definitely smaller than 12.5 over 25 which is equals to a half. So it'll be smaller than a half. And then 50 over 99 and 50 over 100. We see, remember, if we have same numerator, then the smaller denominator will be the larger fraction. Okay, the, the fraction with the smaller denominator will be the larger one. So 90, 50 over 99 is definitely the larger uh, fraction. And 50 over 100 is a half. So it'll be larger than a half. So with one number smaller than a half and one number larger than a half, which one is larger is obvious. Okay, so that's question number 21. Let's move on to question number 24. So the price of a laptop is reduced in a sale by 10%. And if the sale price is 990 pounds, what was the original price of the laptop? So some of the students made mistakes uh, because they didn't quite fully understand uh, or, or they forgot what does reduced by 10% mean. So if we reduce, if we reduce the original price by 10%, that means which that is equivalent to we, we multiply 90% with the original price. Okay, reduce by 10% means we take away 
we take away 10% of the original price. Okay, so if we have 100% at first, uh, originally, and we take away 10%, the rest will definitely be 90% of its original price, right? So that means 90% times the original price is, let's give it in the, in the question, if the sale price is 990 pounds, so it'll be 990 pounds, and um, we want to find the original price over here. So if we know that the original price times 90% is 990 pounds, we can simply move this 90% to the other, to the other side of the equation. The, uh, or in other words, if we divide both sides of the equation with 90%, yeah, the 90% divided by 90% cancels out. And on the right-hand side, we will have the original price equals to 990 pounds divided by 90%. That will give us the original price, which is what we're looking for for this question. So on the right-hand side, we will have Remember 90%, remember your percentage to fraction conversion, it can be written as 90 over 100. And then remember divided by a fraction is turn the fraction on its head and multiply instead. So multiplying is reciprocal. 990 times 100 over 90. Okay. And 990 is basically 90 times 11. It has a common factor 90, so we can cancel out the common factor 90, leaving an 11. The integer so the cancels the 90 cancels out leaving 11 times 100 so that will give us the original price which is 1100 pounds this is the original price so d is the correct answer okay that's question number 24. so moving on question number 25 the clock says half past 10. this is my favorite question let me draw a clock i'll try my best to draw it as round as possible Okay, looks good to me. The clock says half past 10. So uh, this is how a clock looks. Uh, four, four of the uh, 12, three, six, and nine, they're the crucial numbers. And then between 12 and nine, we have 10 and 11. That was poorly draw. So 10 and 11, and then between six and nine, we have seven and eight. And at half past 10, where should the minute hand be pointing at? Exactly, it should be pointing at exactly six. Yeah, and then the, uh, the, the hour hand, where should it be pointing at? At half past 10. Yes, so it should be halfway between 10 and 11. Yeah, so it's, it should be halfway between. So a half, and a half. Okay. Uh, part of my poor drawing. I'm not a. Uh, I'm not an artist. I'm just a mathematics teacher. All right. So before we move on with this question, I will have to give you some general um, background knowledge. So we all know that for a circle, or for a, in other words, a full turn. A full turn is 360 degrees. I think this should be common knowledge. And then that is the same is the same circumstance for this clock right here for the clock face. It is also 360 degrees in total. But on the clock face, let's see. So between 12 and 3, we have 1 and 2. And between 3 and 6, we have 4 and 5. So altogether, how many intervals have we divided the, the clock face into? Let's have a count. Let me change the color. So we have one interval, two intervals, three intervals, four intervals, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. This is eleven in total, and twelve. So altogether, we have twelve intervals. We have divided the three hundred and sixty degrees into twelve equal intervals. So if I ask you what will one e one interval be, you can simply use three hundred and sixty degrees divided by twelve, which will give you the uh, the angle of each interval, which would be thirty degrees. So that means between 12 and 1 is 30, between uh, 1 and 2 is 30 degrees, between 2 and 3 is 30, deg 30 degrees, and so on and so on. Okay, it's all the same thing. So let me uh, erase all the green circles. So we can move on with this question. So the question is asking for what is the angle, the smaller angle between the clock hands? So that means we'll be looking for, let me change to blue. 
we'll be looking for this angle here. This is the smaller one. It is an obtuse angle instead of the reflex angle. So let's see. Uh, so between, we are halfway between 10 and 11 here, and we are exactly at six here. So we can first find one interval, two interval, three intervals, and four intervals between six and 10. We will have four intervals and we know each interval is 30 degrees. So altogether we will have four times 30 degrees, which is 120 degrees in total. All right, but we're not done yet. We still have a, a little angle between between the, the, mid, the mid line and 10, okay? And we know we are halfway, we are half past 10. That means we're halfway between 10 and 11. So we are halfway between the 30 degrees. Now, what's a half of 30 degrees? That's easy to calculate. We can simply take 30 divided by two, which is 15 degrees. So at this 15 to the 120, that will give us the final correct answer, which is 120 degrees plus 15 degrees, 135 degrees. So D is the correct answer, okay? D. Or if you want to do it arithmetically, you can also do it. So we know that the hour hand, it covers one interval every 60 minutes, right? Every, every hour. For six minutes, it moves from 10 to 11, for example, and it moves 30 degrees. Then it will move 30 degrees divided by 60 minutes, 0 0.5 degrees per minute. Okay? And then because it's half past 10, so 30 minutes have passed, then 30 minutes times the speed of it, 0 0.5 degrees per minute, will also give you 15 degrees. Okay, It's also a useful way of thinking. It's a useful trick. Yeah. Right, so two methods. So that's question number 25. Let's move on to question number 29. So, um, right, it's a, it's a conversion problem. So we want to, to convert. So we have different units here. We have meters, kilometers, millimeters, and centimeters. We want to convert them all into one unit so that we can compare them. Okay. We cannot compare them when they're in different units. So 60 meters and 0 0.018 kilometers. We, can we say 60 is larger than 0 0.018? So uh, Andy will be larger? No. Okay. All right. So let's convert them all to one unit, one uh, unitary unit. And let's say meters, because meters is the most common one. So Andy is two-fifths of 60 meters. So we will have two over five times 60, which will be 24 meters. And then Brent is 0 0.018 kilometers. And we know the, the units conversion, 1 km equals to 1,000 meters. Okay, so uh, we, have, we will take 0 0.018 and multiply with 1,000. That means moving the decimal point three digits to the right. So one, two, three. So it will be behind, right behind eight. So we will have, 0 0.018 km equals to 18 meters, right? And then for Chris, Chris is 2,800 millimeters. So we know one centimeter equals to 10 millimeters. And then in the other way around, we can take away a zero and we'll have 280 centimeters. And from centimeters to meters, we know that 10 centimeters is one meter. Okay, uh, let me draw, write it. Another way. So from one meter to one centimeter, we multiply a 10. And in the other way around, if we want to convert cent centimeter to meters, we divide a 10. That means cancel out another zero. So altogether, Chris has 2,800 mm millimeters equals to 28 meters. Okay. And then for Denny, Denny has 80% of 30. Save your questions later, everyone. Save your questions to the end of the walkthrough. I will go through them together. And 80% of 32 meters, so 80% of 32 meters, oh, sorry. So we'll be multiplying 80% with zero point, uh, sorry, uh, with 20, 32. And um, so 80% can be converted into a decimal number, which is 0 0.8. I hope you're all confident with your decimal percentage fraction conversion. So 0 0.8 times 32 will give us 25.6 meters, right? And the last one, Eddie, Eddie is 269 cm centimeters. And to convert from centimeters to meters, we simply divide by 10. So move the decimal number one digit to the left. 
So from behind nine to before nine, so 26.9 meters. Right, and finally, we can have a look. Uh, who flew the furthest? So we want to find the largest number among the five. So 24, 18, 28, 26.9, and 25.6. So apparently 28 is the largest. So Chris flew the furthest. So C is the correct answer. Um, when, I was, when I was doing this paper, I remember it gave me another answer. That, quite, that answer is wrong. So whoever got C, whoever got Chris, you got it correct, congratulations. And then question number 30, a block of cheese weighs 3.85 kilograms. It is cut into five equal pieces. How much does each piece weigh? All right, I said, everyone, uh, save your questions to the end of the walkthrough. I will go through them all together at the end, okay? You can note it down if, you, if you're afraid you'll forget, but save it until the end, okay? Otherwise you're interrupting um, the, me and interrupting the, with the whole lesson. Uh, we might not be able to finish uh, all, the, all the questions, all right? So thank you for understanding. Right, and um, question number 30, a block of cheese weighs 3.85 kilograms. It is cut into five equal pieces. So you see the question, the, the choices we have, so we have kilograms, but we have grams, 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 grams. Oh, sorry, kilograms, right. So uh, another way of thinking is kilograms involves decimal points and decimal points means we might be we might be uh, making mistakes because we don't like decimal points. We want to convert the larger units into smaller units, especially when we are dividing it. Okay, so we convert 3.85 kg kilograms into 3,850 grams. So again, from one kg, from one kilogram, convert to grams, we multiply a thousand. And then we divide it into five equal pieces. So 3,850 3, divided by five, and that will be 770 grams. Because you see, we're, we're working with grams here. So the correct answer should be 770 grams. And because we have kilograms in, our, in the answers, in the choices as well, so let's write the equivalent for grams as well. So it'll be 0. 0.5. 77 grams, uh, sorry, not grams, but kilograms, kg, right? So remember to convert grams to kilograms, we divide by a thousand. That means to um, move the decimal point three digits to the left. So before the first seven, so it'll be 0 0.77 kilograms. Do we have 0 0.77 kilograms in our choices? For E, it's 7.7, .7. no. For A, it's 770, ridiculous. So um, D is the, is the only correct answer. 770 grams. Okay, let's move on to question number 32. Uh, what is the median temperature for the whole year? Right, so for, to find the median, what we need to do first, we have 12 numbers here from January to December. We need to rearrange all these numbers in ascending order. So from smallest to largest, I've done it for you. 3.3, 5.1, 6.4, 6.6, 7.3, 7.8, and 10.1, 12.1, 15.4, 15.9, 16.1, and 17.6. So all together, because we, there are 12 months in a year, so there are 12 numbers, 12 terms, okay? And here, to find median for a number sequence, there are two situations. The first situation is the easier one when we have odd number of terms or odd number of numbers in a number sequence, so odd number of terms. In that way, say we are we are dealing with the first five numbers, 3.3, 5.1, 6.4, 6.6, 7.3. We have five terms. Then the median will be the one right in the middle. Okay, the third one. Yeah. So uh, median equals to middle term. And then the second one is a harder version, a harder situation. And when we have even number of terms. So some of you got confused how we find the median when we have even number of terms, say uh, the first six numbers, three points, or the four, first four numbers, 3.3, 5.1, 6.4, 6.6. .6. Then the median will be still right in the middle, but there is no number in the middle. That means we will have to find the average or the mean between the, the two adjacent digits, uh, the two adjacent numbers. So median will be equal to the mean 
of adjacent terms. So that means we find to find the median, we find the average of 5.1 and 6.4. This is an example. So that will be 5.1 plus 6.4 divided by 2, which is 11.5 divided by 2. And that will be 5.75, right? So now, after we know how to find a median, we can find the median for this question now. So we have 12 numbers, then we should be looking at between, um, between six and seven, right? So this is one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six. So 7.8 and 10.1. This is the sixth term. This is the seventh term. We want to find the one in the middle, the median. So we find the average, the mean of 7.8 and 10.1. So 7.8 plus 10.1, divided by the total number of terms, two will give us the final answer. So this is 17.9 above and two at the bottom. The answer should be 8.95 degrees Celsius. So C is the correct answer, okay? That's question number 32. Let's move on to question number 34. So find the value of X. Um, a hidden condition in this question is that it is a regular pentagon. So all the five sides, are equal to each other and all the five interior angles are equal to each other with regular pentagons. Right, so remember from the summer holiday term courses, with regular, pen, with regular polygons, and in this case, regular pentagon, how we find each interior angle. That is the first step we solve this problem because you see, we want to find the angle X. Okay? And angle X is contained in this interior angle, which we know we can find, we, should, we can find. Yeah, that is the first step. Let's have a look. So the interior angle formula for regular pentagon is 180 degrees. Actually, for n-sided polygon, let me write it here. So n-sided polygon. Okay, that will be for the numerator. We have 180 degrees times n minus two, and then at the bottom we will have n. So on top, we have the sum of all interior angles. Yeah, it is, the, uh, it is the formula to find the sum of all interior angles. And at the bottom, the n, the n means the number of interior angles. And we know because it's a regular polygon, it's a regular pentagon, all five interior angles are equal to each other. That means that's why we can just simply divide it, use division. Okay. And the sum of all interior angles, uh, why do we have 180 degrees times n minus two? Well, um, to prove it is a bit complicated. You just need to remember it and I'll show you. I'll show you why is it the case. So for triangles, this is a, when n equals to three, we have three sides. The, the sum of all interior angles is 180 degrees. This is common knowledge. Yeah, and you see, that will be 180 degrees times three minus two, which is 180 times one, so it's 180. And then for a square, for a square we have 90, 90, 90, 90, so it's 360 degrees, and that will be 180 degrees times, for, for it has four sides, so n will be four. n equals to four, then 180 degrees times four minus two, so it'll be 180 degrees times two, so the, the sum of all interior angles will be 360 degrees. And then reasonably, for pentagons, for five sides, we will have 180 degrees times five minus two, which is 180 degrees times three, which is 540 degrees. That is the sum of all the five interior angles. And because for regular polygons, the number of sides is equal to the number of interior angles. So we will have five interior angles all, all together. So 540 degrees divided by five angles will give us each interior angle, which is 108 degrees. So we know that this interior angle here will be 108 degrees, right? And similarly, because this is also an interior angle, so it will be 108 degrees as well. And that is the key for the second step for us to keep solving this question. Just give me a sec, let me clear the space here. So because we know it's a regular pentagon, that means all five sides are equal to each other, including these two sides. And if you consider this triangle here, you will find that it's an isosceles triangle. Let me put it flat like this. So it's an isosceles triangle, part of my poor drawing. And we have a top angle 108 degrees, okay? And for a, one important 
property for isosceles triangle is that the two the two um, angles, the two bottom angles are equal to each other. Okay? The, the two angles adjacent to the two equal sides, right? So because we know the two, the three angles add up to 180 degrees. So that means 180 degrees take away 108 degrees. It is the sum of these two angles, which is 72 degrees. And because these two angles are equal to each other, so we can simply take 72 degrees divided by two, and that will give us 36 degrees, which is one angle. So this is 36 degrees, and this is 36 degrees as well. So we know now that x plus 36 degrees is one interior angle of the regular pentagon, which is 108 degrees. So x will be equal to 72 degrees. So d is the correct answer. Okay, that's how we solve this. Two steps, right? And one key knowledge you should know the, the, the formula. This you should all remember by heart. Okay, keep this in your mind. It will be really useful in 11 plus exams. This uh, formula to find this formula to find the, uh, the each interior angle of a regular inside the polygon. Okay, let's move on to question number 41. I've been repeating myself times and times that if you have any question, you will save it to the end of the walkthrough. Okay, I will not answer any raised hand right now during the walkthrough, okay? That's the rule, rule is the rule. And question number 41, um, Owen is facing east. Um, he turns 225 degrees in a clockwise direction, and then he turns 45 degrees in an anti-clockwise direction. Which direction is he facing now? Okay, so um, let's draw the north, south, west, east diagram. So north is on top and south is at the bottom. West is on the left and east is on the right. And Owen is standing in, in, in the middle. Let's say this is Owen with some hair. So he is facing east at the beginning. So he's facing to the right. And then he turns 225 degrees in a clockwise direction. So which direction is clockwise? It should be this direction. Yeah, this is clockwise. Okay. You can take out your, your clock in your in your house and have a look. This direction is clockwise. 225 degrees. So we know that. Um, between east and south, it's 90. So we have a right angle here. And then between south and west, is another 90 degrees. So 180 degrees. So 225 degrees, take away one, 180, will be 45 degrees left. Okay. So he should be halfway between west and north. So this will be 45 degrees. And the other is 45 degrees as well, because we know we have a right, we have a right angle between west and north. Okay, so he will be facing this way. So uh, west, northwest, after he turns 225 degrees. He then turns 45 degrees in an anti-clockwise direction, in this direction, 45 degrees. So it means he will be facing exactly west. Okay, that is one way to solve this problem. Or you can you can consider the two the two operations as a whole, as a whole, okay? So he first turns 225 in clockwise, and then he turned 45 degrees in anti-clockwise. And if, you know, if you turn 45 degrees clockwise and then 45 degrees anti-clockwise, overall, you haven't moved, okay? you remain still. So that means we can take away the, 20, the 45 degrees from the, two, the 255 degrees. And you, you will see that overall, Owen turned 180 degrees clockwise. Okay? So um, from east, we turn 180 degrees clockwise, we will end up at facing west. So behind us, okay, the opposite direction. So D is the correct answer. Right, let's move on to question number 45. Right, so with this one, um, it's, it's, a, it's a pure geometry problem. And I will need to make use of this cube right here. So it will help me, it's my good buddy. So first, the figure shown below is made up of 12 identical cubes. So 12 of these cubes, all identical to each other. And then the whole solid is painted green. That means the top, the sides, okay, the, the, all, the, all the sides, and then at the, the bottom, the bottom, they're all painted green, okay? Not just the sides you can see, but including the bottom as well. Some of you made mistakes because you haven't included the bottom, okay? How many of the small cubes have only three faces painted green. So let's have a look at these cubes one by one, right? So with this cube right here, it will be painted. So uh, say it's, it's, um, facing, it's facing me or, um, right. So the back, the back side is, 
it's not included. It's not it's it's not painted. Okay, uh, the one that are outside is the top, the front, the bottom, the left, and the right. So there are altogether five sides that that's been painted. So it doesn't count. All right, and then this cube, this cube has the top, the bottom, the left, and the right. No front. Okay, the front has been uh, covered. So only four sides. But again, we're only we're, we're looking for cubes with only three faces. So this one doesn't count. Okay, I'll use cross instead. So cross out, cross out. Right, and this cube. This cube is the same with this cube right here. It also has front, left, right, top, bottom. Okay, so five sides doesn't count. And then this one is the same. This cube is the same as the uh, th as this one. Four sides: top, down, bottom, uh, top, bottom, right, left. Okay, so four sides doesn't count. And then this one. How about this one? This one, the the front, the back. The right, the left, they are all covered. The only, the only um, size, the two sides that are exposed, is the top and the bottom. So only two sides, all right? So it doesn't count. How about this, this one? This one, we have top, bottom, and front. The back, the left, and the right, they're all covered, okay? So this one, we will have three sides. Three sides painted green, so three faces. So this one counts. And then the one at the right, you will find it's the same circumstance with the one on the right, on the left. Also, the top, the bottom, and the front is painted green, the three faces. The back, the left, the right, they're all covered. They're not exposed. And then how about this one, this one right here? This one is not because its top is exposed, the front is exposed, the right is exposed, and the bottom is exposed. There are totally one, two, three, four, four sides. Okay, so it doesn't count. This one, this one is the same as this one. It has top, bottom exposed, only two sides, so it doesn't count. How about this one? This one is the same with this one. You will find that uh, the front, the top, the bottom, the, the left, they, the four sides, the four faces are exposed, so it doesn't count. And this one. So some of you made mistakes by including these two as well. So these two, because they are you know symmetrical, so we only need to consider one 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 of them. So uh, we will have the top, yeah, the bottom, yeah. They are exposed. They will be painted green, and then we will have this side. Okay, this side is painted green. If you have, a, if you uh, consider um, V facing the same direction as this as this shape, this side, which should be uh, left side, right? The left side and the uh, the front side. They are both painted green. So altogether, top, bottom, left, front, four sides, okay, not three. So altogether, only two small cubes will have only three faces painted green. So the correct answer is C. So it requires a little bit of spatial imagination, okay, but um, overall, I think you should be able to handle it. So that's question number 45. Let's move on to so question number 46. An electric light uses two and a, and a quarter pence worth of electricity every three hours. Okay, that's good information. And then the light is left is left on from 8 a.m. on Monday until 8 p.m. on a Wednesday. Right. So we have two intervals, okay, two parts. How much does the, does the electricity cost? So the first part will be. Give me a sec. First part. Oops. First part will be um, from Monday, 8 a.m. to 8 a.m. Wednesday. Okay. And then from 8 a.m. Wednesday to 8 p.m. Wednesday. So lots of you made mistakes here because you, you thought, yeah, you didn't see the p.m. You thought it, it was from 8 a.m. on Monday to 8 a.m. on Wednesday. Yeah, and then you found that, oh, my, my answer is wrong. So for the first part, for the first interval, we have from 8 a.m. to 8 a.m. from Monday to Wednesday. How many days have passed? We have two days passed. Two days. And we know there are 24 hours each day. So altogether, 48 hours have passed. 24 times 2, which is 48 hours. And then from Wednesday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. to Wednesday, 8 p.m., a half, half of a day have passed. Okay, so the, here's a trick to quickly calculate the, the time span between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. So from a.m. to p.m., if we have the same number in front, say 5 a.m. to 5 p.m., if the number is the same, then the time span will be half, half a day. 
12 hours. Okay, so it's a trick. Or we can count it using the, uh, the old school way from, five, from 8 to 9 a.m., 10, 11, 12, uh, 1 p.m., 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Right? So, oh, sorry, I should be uh, using from 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. You see? So, altogether 12 hours. So, it's just half a day. Then, altogether, how many hours have passed? 48 plus 12 is 60 hours. So 60 hours have passed. And we know that the price for the electricity is two and a quarter pence every three hours, right? So how many of these two and a quarter pence should we pay? We simply take 60, let me clear this space here. What's the time right now? We still have nine minutes left. I'll try my best to cover, to cover everything in time, not to go over time. No guarantee since I was interrupted. And 60 divided by every three hours, that will give us, we should pay 20 parts of the two and a quarter pence, right? So we multiply the 20 with the two and a quarter. We can convert this mixed number into an uh, improper fraction, which is 20 times nine over four. So remember it's uh, on the new, for the numerator it's two times four plus one, which is nine. And then 20 can be canceled out with a common factor of four, leaving a five. So it'll be five times nine, so it's 45 pence. Final answer is D, 45 pence. Okay, that's question number 46. And then question number 47. The bar graph below shows the number of each type of storybooks borrowed by the pupils in the class. There are 30 pupils in the class. Each of them borrowed at least one book and or and at most two books. So it's actually, um, instead of at least and at most, there's only two options, right? You, you either borrow one book or you, bought, you, you borrowed two books, right? Only two, two of these circumstances. And how many pupils borrowed two books? Okay. So let's first look at the graph. Let's extract the information from the graph. So we have all these genres, doesn't matter, don't care. Um, what we do care is the, the, uh, the actual amount of the value of each, uh, each genre, each of these bars. Okay. So um, we can have, so with the horizontal line, we have the genres and the vertical line, we will have the number of books borrowed. So we can have for fantasy, we see it's uh, exactly at five, so five books borrowed. For comics, we have, um, it's here at this level, so it's one below 10. And you see we have from zero to 10, we have 10 intervals. That means each interval will be 10 divided by 10, one. So one level below, one interval below will be 10 minus one, nine. And then for science fiction, we will have one level beneath, uh, uh, below 15. So it'll be 15 minus one, 14, all right? So be careful with this because um, it's not always, one interval is not always one with these graph problems, okay? So you have to calculate how much is one interval. Sometimes the question will give you a track and change this interval into 0 0.2, 0 0.5, stuff like that. You will have to take the number, so from 10 to zero, take the 10, and then divide by how many intervals are there between 10 and uh, 10 and zero, okay? And that will give you how much is one interval. Right, moving on, coming back. So with mystery, we have two levels be below 10, which is eight. And then for adventure, we have three levels or two levels above five, which is seven. So five books borrowed, and nine books, 14 books, eight books, seven books, then we can find the total number of storybooks borrowed. So five plus nine plus 14 plus eight plus seven. So we can do fast calculation. Eight plus seven is 15, 15 plus five is 20, 20 plus nine is 29, and 29 can be viewed as 40, for, uh, sorry, uh, 30. 30 plus 14 is 44. Because we added one more than we should, so we take away the one, that will give us 43. So 43 books borrowed altogether. And how many pupils are there in total? There are 30 pupils. Yeah, for those, uh, for, for all of you who have been through the summer holiday courses, you have taken the summer holiday courses, they should, this type of problem should seem very familiar, very similar to you, okay? So um, it might not be the same type, the exact same type, but it's the same, um, sorry, it might not be the exact same words, but it's the same type. Okay, so we have 30 pupils, which means we have 30, uh, remember the chicken rabbit problem. We have 30 animals in total, either rabbit or chicken, and each of them borrow either one book or two books. Then 
a chicken, in this case, will have one leg, one leg chicken, or a rabbit with two legs, two leg rabbit. Well, it might seem bizarre, but if you multiply one and two, both by two, you one times two, two times two, it will look exactly the same. So two leg chicken and four leg rabbits. But in this case, in this question, uh, each chicken has one leg and each rabbit has two legs, okay? And then altogether we have 43 books, which means we have altogether 43 legs. We want to solve how many pupils borrowed two books. So how many two leg animals we have? How many, how many rabbits? Find the number of rabbits. And recall from the summer holiday term, if we are gonna use the assumption method, okay, which is what we're gonna look at, the assumption method tells us if you assume they're all chicken, then the first answer you get will be rabbits. Okay. And we want to find rabbits, so we assume that all the all the animals are chicken. So all of them are one one are with one leg. So all of these pupils borrowed one book. And then because we have 30 pupils, then we'll, they will borrow 30 times one, 30 books. And with chicken, chicken rabbit problems, it will be 30 legs. But because we have 43 legs in real life, that means we have considered well, we have considered 13 less legs than we should. So 43 minus 30 is 13 legs. Okay. And why is that? Because we have we have two leg rabbits, but we have we are, we are treating them as one leg chicken. So for each rabbit, we are we have considered two minus one equals one one less leg. We have um, chopped off one leg. For each rabbit. Okay, so we have to give that one leg back. How many legs do we have to give back to? We have to give 13 legs back. Okay, and each rabbit will require one leg. Then how many rabbits do we do we have? 13 divided by one. 13 rabbits. So 13 two, two books. Okay, so 13 pupils who borrowed two books. You see? So although this looks like a graph problem, the essence of it, the core, is still a chicken rabbit problem. So 13, B is the correct answer. So this, uh, this is another ability you should know um, because in exams, the exams, the questions won't tell you which um, module or which ability it's, it's asking you to have or it's testing you. Okay? You, you will have to have the ability to look at the question and then recognize it, you know, identify which type of problem this is. Is this a chicken rabbit problem? Is this an interval problem? Is this a geometry problem? And so on and so on, okay? So moving on, we have three questions left, but it's uh, already, it's almost, it's almost six o'clock. If you, you have any urgent issues you need to attend to, um, at, five, at six o'clock, you are free to leave. We will send the playback in the WeChat group as well. And if you, if you're, if you, if you can stay, you can, you can stay. Right, then question number 48. So the shape is drawn on a triangle dotted, or dotted grid, so triangle dotted grid, and the area of, each small regular, the area of each small regular triangle is one. Okay, so it's a regular triangle. That means it's, it's an equilateral triangle, which is a key information. It will, we will need it to solve this question. So, well, we know that each triangle is, its area is one. So we can split this trapezium, this right trapezium into little triangles by connecting all the dots inside it. Again, if you're free, if you want to leave, you can, you're free to leave, right? So, um, yeah, we have how many how many triangles do we have here? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, uh, thirteen. And how about here? This one doesn't look the same as the rest. But I'm telling you that this also counts as one one little triangle, fourteen. Okay, so the answer is C, fourteen. And why? Why is it equal? To the to other little triangles, we can view it can view it in a rhombus over here. Why is it rhombus? Because all four sides are equal to each other, right? So this is if we if we connect the longer diagonal of the rhombus, yeah, we we have divided the area of the rhombus into two, one half, two half, two equal halves. And so it's half a rhombus, and we can have a look at another rhombus. This one over here. This is also a rhombus. If we connect this smaller diagonal, we will have one triangle, two triangle, which is which we recognize. This is the small regular triangle here, 
and we know the area of it is one. So the rhombus area will be two. And we know this little triangle is half the area of a rhombus. So it'll be two divided by two, one as well. Okay, so that's why. All right, so that's question number 48. And um, right, uh, I just, just for you to think, um, I'll, I'll give you a challenging method. So with triangle dotted grid, this, uh, this method only works for triangle dot grid, all right? So we have the top base, which is three, and then we have the bottom base, which is four, and then we have the height, which is one layer, one layer of the dots, and then two layers. So if the height is two layers, then we can apply the formula, except that this time the formula is a bit different. We have top base plus bottom base, which is seven, multiply the height, the two layers, and that's it ends there. We do not need to divide everything by two because we are at triangle dotty grid. Okay. You can have a think. You can have a think. Uh, and I'll explain why at the end of the walkthrough if you're interested. So seven times two, 14. All right. That's question number 48. Let's move on to question number 49. So a book costs 8.32 pounds. Mary buys the book and pays with a 10 pound note. All the change she get, uh, yeah, she gets is coins. And what is the smallest number of coins that she can receive in change, right? So we first find the number of change. The amount of change is 10 minus 8.32, which is 1.68 pounds. So with this type of problem, we want to find the smallest number of coins. So we want the smallest term, so the small, smallest uh, number. Yeah. So we remember, we, the method is we, we consider the largest, the largest value we have. Again, in order, systematically from largest to smallest. This is the order we should be thinking of. Okay, so remember we uh, remember how what value of coins we have. We have one pound coins. And then the next largest is 50 pence, and then 20 pence, 10 pence, um, five pence, two pence, one pence. Okay, so these are all the, the available coins and also two pounds, but we don't, we won't need to use two pounds in this question. Then first, we consider the largest one. Can we have a one pound coin? We can have because it's 1.68. Yeah, so yeah, one, 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 point, one pound coin. And then 50 pence, can we have 50 pence coin? We can because it's 0 0.5, 0 0.68, so it's 68 pence. Okay, so we can have one 50 pence coin. Can we have a 20 pence coin after, after considering a 50 pence? We cannot because 50 plus 20 is 70, which is larger than 68, okay? So it's more than we should give, more than we should get. So 20 pence, no. Can we have 10, per, can 10, 10 pence? Yes, we can, because 50 plus 10 is 60, which is less than 68, all right? So what's left is eight pence, and you see five plus two plus one is eight. So one of each. So altogether, one, two, three, five, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, six coins. That is the smallest number we can get, okay? So um, that I hope you remember the, the method for these type of problems. Consider from the largest value you can use to the smallest, okay? And that will give you the smallest number. If you want the largest number, then you go the other way around. It's from the smallest to the largest, okay? Right, then moving on to the, next, the final question. Oh, this one is a bit challenging indeed. So, Points A and B have been plotted on the coordinate grid below. Point C can be plotted on the grid so that when A, when A, B, and C are joined, they form an isosceles triangle. Which of the following can't be the coordinates of the point R? So that means one will not be the coordinate, four others will be, will be um, correct. Let's look at the first one. Coordinate 2, 6, point 2, 6. So first move 2 to the right, and then 6 to the top. We'll get a point right here. This is our C1. And then after we connect A, B, and C, okay, we will find that um, A, B, you see A, B is the diagonal of a two times one, two, three, four, a two times four rectangle. We don't know the length, but we know it is, a di it is, it is the diagonal of a two times four rectangle. And you see, you find that B, C is the same case. For the blue rectangle, BC is the diagonal of a two times four rectangle as well. So that means the lengths of AB and BC must be the same. So AB equals to BC, ABC 
all together is an isosceles triangle. No problem. At two six is correct. And then the second one. Uh, let's skip the second one and the third one. Let's look at this the D and E first. Yeah, because uh, the second one and the third one requires a uh, higher level knowledge called Pythagoras theorem, which I will introduce to you later on after we look at D and E. So D is six zero, which means we only need to move six to the right and no units up, uh, up or down. So at six zero on the X axis, we will have a, this is C, this is C2, A, B, C, all connected. So you see, a C is the diagonal of a two times four rectangle, and A B is again a direct the diagonal of a two times four rectangle. So A B and A C will be equal to each other. So we have A B C and isosceles triangle, no problem. Six zero is also correct. And how about eight zero? <clears throat> Some of you thought that eight zero cannot be. Let's have a look. So say eight zero is C, and connect A C, A B, and B C. You find that. AB is again the diagonal of a two times four rectangle. And BC is again a diagonal of a two times four rectangle. So that means AB and BC are equal to each other. So again, we still have an isosceles triangle. E is correct. Then we have A correct, D correct, and E correct. What's left is just B and C. We'll have a, we will have to make our final choice between B and C. Let's have a look. So for B, for two seven, two to the right and seven up here. This is C, C3. Let's connect C4, sorry. Let's connect AC, CB, and AB. Okay, so first, it's easy for us to find the length of AC. Yeah, it's seven minus two, so it's five. What's tricky is how we find the length of BC, and that's where we need to use the Pythagoras theorem. So the Pythagoras theorem works with all types of right-angled triangles. So it claims that if we have a right angled triangle and we have our uh, the two sides adjacent to the right angle, A and B, sides A and B, and the one opposite to the right angle, the angle of the, the C, then we will have the, the following relationship that A squared plus B squared equals to C squared. Okay, and let's have a look. For this one, we will have this right angled triangle. And you see, this side is three and this side length is four. So these are the two, the A squared and the A and the B. So we have three squared, the A squared, plus the B squared, the four squared, which is equals to nine plus 16. So it's 25 and it's C squared, which is our BC, the BC length. So 25 is a square number. We can find that C will be equal to five. So this is five over here as well. So we have AC equals to BC. Again, and that's also least triangle. So B is the correct answer. All the all the correct one ruled out, then the the rest, uh, the C left must be the one that cannot be the coordinates of point R. So C is the correct answer for this one. Okay, we choose C for this question. We can also have a look at two eights. Okay, see if it's actual, uh, if if it's really the correct choice. So two eight is over here. So uh, this is eight, then AC, AC will be eight minus two, six. And then BC, again, we, we look at it in, in, in a right angled triangle. And luckily for us, this is a, uh, a right angled isosceles triangle. You see four and four. So for C squared, we will have four squared plus four squared, which is 16 plus 16. So it'll, it'll be 32. Then it will be, square root of 32. Again, this is mm, a bit advanced, not something you should be happy with, or not something you must be happy with, or you must be familiar with. Okay, just a fun extension. You can um, can listen to it for fun, right? Know it for fun. Pythagoras theorem. So we will have C. C equals to square root of 32, which is equal to 4 times square root of 2, compared with 6. So there is no way four, four times uh, four and uh, sorry four times square root of two equals to six. Okay, they will never equal to each other. So that means um, AC not equal to BC not equal to AB because BC is the diagonal of a four times four square, while AB is the diagonal of a two times four rectangle. And so they, the three this is a scalene triangle, not a isosceles anymore, right? Oof. 
Um, that's been a long walkthrough. Thank you for staying till the end, everyone. That's all the questions in GL mock three, three, mock text three. Do you have any questions? Yes, uh, Albert, I think. Yes, Albert, go ahead. Um, I'm not sure on question 32. 32, let me have a look. Is it included in the PBT? Yes. Ah, this one, right. So which part is bothering you? Is it bothering the, you how we find the median? Uh, yes. Yes, so for when we have an odd number of terms of the sequence, say we have 3.3, 5.1, 6.4, 6.6, 7.3, we have one, two, three, four, five, five numbers, yeah? Then it will be easy to find the median. It's just the one in the middle. Just, just write the number in the middle and that will be the median, okay? And then unluckily for us, in this question, we have 12 terms. That is an even number of terms. And then to find the even number, uh, to find the median of a number sequence with even number of terms, we will have to find first um, the place in the middle. Okay, where the place in the middle will be um, between, say for, for this one, for example, we have 3.3, 5.1, 6.4, 6.6. We have four numbers Then we'll be looking at uh, so on the right-hand side, we'll have two. On the left-hand side, we'll have two. So we'll look at between, in between, right? But we have no number in between. Yeah, There is no number between 5.1 and 6.4. So we cannot find the median directly. But uh, we, def we, we define, the rule is, you find the, the mean, right? The, the average of the adjacent two terms, the one on the left and the one on the right. You add them up and you divide by two. That's how we find the average, remember? The total sum divided by total number of terms. Yeah, and that will give us that will give us the median. Oh, nice. the median is the mean of adjacent terms. If you do not read, okay. Okay. Not, did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. No problem. And uh, how do you? Okay. So you know the the one you did before question thirty. Okay. This one, question number 20, 22, 29, sorry. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. you said that one meter is 10, 10 centimeters. Shouldn't it be 100 centimeters? Yes, it's correct. It should be 100 centimeters. Apologies. So what will be the correct answer then? It's a uh, hundred, one meter is 100. Uh, divide by 100 and times 100. Yeah, then the correct answer will be 29 point, uh, 26.9. So, uh, Denny, uh, sorry, uh, Eddie, yeah, E will be the correct answer. Yes, thank you for pointing that out. And apologies for, for this part. Yeah, getting a bit rusty with you in this conversion. Yes, hello, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was also pointing out that because it would be. Yes, thanks. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, that's correct. So uh, it should be uh, the relationship between meters and centimeters should be a uh, hundred a hundred times relationship. Yeah, I'll, I'll correct it here. So uh, two two thousand oh, sorry two thousand and eight hundred millimeters equals to two hundred and eighty centimeters, which is two point eight meters. Yes. So E is the correct answer. Thank you. And the administrator. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I think the same question for this number 29. If is is A, Andy is the correct answer because Andy is two fifths of times 60 meter. So mm -hmm. uh, per the calculation, it should be like uh, over 20, 20, me 20 meters or uh, 24. Actually, it's 24. So yeah, just personally, I think Andy is 24. So among the five of them, A should be the correct answer. Or I'm just got totally confused. Okay, uh, so let's have a look. So two fifths times 60. So we first divide 60 by five, which is 12. Yeah, did I do it correctly? Yes, it's yes, 12. Right. It's 20, yeah. 24. And then two times 12. Yes, it's 24. So Andy is 24 meters. And then uh, we just cleared that it should be 2.8 meters for Chris. So it's not the correct answer. 
Eddie, uh, this is for Brent, it's 18 meters. For Denny, it's 25.6 meters. And then for Eddie, it's 26.9 meters. So among the five of them, Eddie flew the furthest. So he is. No, 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 no. Do be slowly. Denny, 8%. 8%, that means 8% times 32 meters. So it shall be over two meters. Eight, oh sorry, 80%. Oh, okay, 80, all right. Yeah, so 80%, Danny, that means 32 Danny times 80%. Be, oh, yes. Danny should be, the, should be the right answer. No, Danny is 25.6, because if you uh, times 32 with 0 0.8, which is 80%, you will get 25.6 meters. But Eddie is, is just over two meters. 269 cm is just over two meters, less than three meter. Is that ah, right? I see, right. Yeah, I was getting really rusty with a uh, meter to centimeter calculation. Yeah, Thank so you very much. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, yes, Danny is the correct totally answer. Totally like confused because it's very obvious, like right? it's not very yes, difficult yes. question. Yes, sorry about that. So uh, centimeters with meters conversion is 100. Uh, times 100 relationship, I got it totally, I for, totally forgot, so 2.69 meters. All right, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. So the last one, 269 cm equals to 2.69 m meters. Oof. I, was, I was also learning something from this walkthrough as well. Thank you, everyone. Yes, Eric? Eric, are you there? It okay, looks like Eric is not there. Uh, Oppo, do you have any question? Um, for the last one, I want to know how did you get that uh, B and C isn't an isosceles triangle? Okay, for this one, uh, so which one would you like to know? Uh, why C is not an isosceles triangle? Yeah, Oppo? Why B and C? So B is an isosceles triangle. Okay, let, let's have a look. So let's have a look at C first, since we have the diagram. So AC, because A is at 0, 2, and uh, sorry, 2, 2, and C is at 2, 8. So the distance between AC is 8 minus 2, 6, all right? Um, so that means AC's length is 6. And then for BC, so uh, you will need to use the Pythagoras theorem, A squared plus B squared equals to C squared. So an AB is the two sides that are adjacent, that are next to the, the right angle, which is the two, four over here. So that means to find BC, we will need to, so C equals the square root of A squared plus B squared. So it's four squared plus four squared is 32. Then C equals to square root of 32. You can also express six in a, in a form of square root number. So six equals the square root of 36 because six squared is 36. So this, these two numbers are not equal to each other. So that means AC is not equal to BC. And then let's have a look at AB. So again, using the, the, the Pythagoras theorem, we will have two and four next to the right angle over here. So AB will be a square root of two squared plus four squared which should be four plus six, which, which would be square root of 20. So you see, we have three numbers, three square root numbers, which is square root of 32, square root of 36, and square root of 20. See, so all of them are not equal to each other. It's a scaling triangle. And then we can have a look at B. So with B, we have um, two seven as our C coordinates. So C is here, two seven. That means our AC, the length of our AC side is seven minus two, which is five. And then BC and then AB, okay? So um, again, we can, we can apply the Pythagoras theorem for BC. So BC is the, is the opposite side of the right angle in this triangle over here. So one side is three and the other side is four. So A is three and B is four, which is a classic model 
for right angled triangles. If this is three, this is four, this must be five because the, the C side will be square root of three squared plus four squared, which is square root of nine plus 16, which is square root of not 25. So it'll be five, okay? Uh, yes, Ovo, did that uh, answer your question? Uh, yes. Yes, thank you. And uh, yes, Sophie, do you have any question? Um, I was wondering if, and it's because I came in late, so mm -hmm. is there any questions that were before question 10? Question 10, there, there is one, question number two. Let's have a look. Oops, it's stuck. Oh yeah, no, it's, it's not stuck. So uh, it's easy, I'll just quickly go through it. So Jim, Jim and his eight friends, that means one plus eight altogether, eight people, or uh, sorry, one plus eight is nine, nine children altogether. They're gonna share six pizzas equally. So six pizzas shared by nine children. Be careful what you, what you write on the numerator and the denominator. It's pizzas shared by children, not children shared by pizzas. Okay, so six on top and nine at the bottom. So, and then leave the fraction to its simplest form. We'll give you E, so two over three. Okay, uh, did that answer your question, Sophie? Yeah. Yes, thank, thank you. you. No problem. And sure, do you have any question? Um, for the Think Academy mock test, when I looked back at 29, it was D. So is it Denny or Eddie? Okay, let me have a look. 29. Is it yes, Denny it should be. Eddie? Yeah, it should be Denny because, again, Eddie, uh, I, my steepest apologies. I got very rusty. I forgot that it should be 100 times relationship between meters and centimeter conversion instead of 10, which I made a huge mistake over there. So in Eddie, instead of 26.9 meters, he should be 2.69 meters. Yeah, and Denny is the, 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 sorry, the largest of them all, 25.6 meters. So the correct answer is D. I'll also clarify it in the, uh, in the group chat. Okay. Yes, Eric, do you have any question? Uh, on number 24. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of confused on that. Okay. So um, do you know the meaning of reduced by 10%? Is that clear? Uh, yeah, I know that. Uh -huh. Then that means the sale price. The sale price is after it's being the original price being reduced. So we, we take away the ten. We take away ten percent from the original price. So what's left? What's left is the sales price, and it is ninety percent of the original price. So far, so good. Yeah. Yeah. So that means ninety percent times the original price is ninety nine hundred and ninety pounds. Yeah. Yeah. So to find the original price, because we multiplied a 90% to get the, the 900 and 990 pounds, then to find the original price, we will have to divide it. We will have to divide it back. The same oh. reason as if I have A uh, times two is 16. Uh, sorry, I should, I should do it like this. So A is eight and then A times two is 16. And then A, uh, 16 divided by two will give us back. Uh, move us back to A again. 